I'd like to welcome our speakers, Dr. Seth Lawrenson and Dr. Remy Lesseur from Ag Research. Seth is a senior scientist specialising in soil and water dynamics. His current research uses biophysical and spatial models to understand environmental dynamics at a landscape level. And Dr. Remy Lesseur is a landscape ecologist with a PhD in ecosystem services mapping. They will present Hyperfarm, designing prosperous and sustainable landscapes that meet farmer and community expectations. I welcome them up now. Kia ora, tēnā katoa katoa. Thank you very much for the invite. Uh, my name's Seth, as, as Norm said. Um, you have made the right decision. I didn't. Uh, I thought that he I didn't think he should have given you the option there. <laughs> um, and my colleague Remy Lazur. Um, so, um, so my background's in, in soil and soil physics, as Norm said. Um, I guess where we are thinking now is that it's good to have all that really good science, but we need ways in, uh, uh, for that science to move through to the people who need to use it, essentially, and that's where a lot of our work uh, currently is focused. Um, and I'm going to go... Oh, and I put the... Uh, uh, and I should say, may the fourth be with you. I have to say that because my son will, won't let it down if, uh, if, uh, um, if I didn't. I put the old um, things there that... Uh, he said, you've got to do it, Dad. So <laughs> I did. <laughs> Joyce, um, so we're probably going to tag team it a bit. Um, we both work on this project. We're, we're um, quite often a team of um, um, two or three, so, so we know it well. Um, these emerging pressures you guys will know um, extremely well. Uh, I put it up there for context for setting the scene, but essentially um, no need to go into it uh, in great detail other than to say in our minds they centre around four central issues, which is around biodiversity, uh, climate change, consumers and water quality. And from what I've already heard this morning, they are emblazoned on, on, the, um, on the minds of many. So... Um, if we were to respond to those challenges, I guess in, in, in our minds, we see that uh, that, that will most more than likely um, require a shift in the way that we're managing our current enterprises, but also might um, raise the, the opportunity for, um, for um, new enterprises within um, uh, our, our portfolio of what we do. But, but I guess we're we would like to be part of the discussion is to say, well, those business decisions trying to achieve those new futures are often quite complex and involve um, many different criteria to the point where, um, you know, uh, you know we, we could be farming beef or we could be farming blind venison, um, which is um, another one of my son's jokes. I'll tell him that that one fell down like a lead balloon. Uh, <laughs> Um, but essentially, we need to understand a multiple of different things coming in to that decision. Um, and so the world is essentially getting more and more complex. Uh, where I think that we as scientists have a role in that is to say, well, we have a responsibility in my mind to make information flow and to assist, not, not make, but assist in the decision making process. You, yeah, right, we're, we're tag teaming here. So, um, so essentially in our minds, where we look at um, landscapes, and I think um, and Melissa touched on this just before, we're going to start seeing more complex landscapes, um, more uh, diversity in those landscapes, uh, and, and potentially a more diverse array of, uh, um, of um, uh, uh, products coming from that land. And, and the decision to, to, to um, you know, the sort of the, the guidance towards that future is, uh, is often uh, reliant on, on, a, on a vision that might be set at a catchment level or at a, at a, at a regional level, but ultimately the decisions will, will invariably come down to somebody, individuals at land uh, uh, level uh, making, those, making those calls to change, essentially. And where we would like, again, to be in that the discussion is to be able to put information in front of people, assist with the flow, so those uh, discussions can arrive at the kitchen table 
rather than um, reactionary to, to what needs to happen. And I'll show a short video, and I put this video, we put this video in especially because it's got some of your colleagues. Um, uh, project here we've called a hyper farm. And uh, what we're trying to do is, is find ways for farmers to actually better comprehend a future scenario for their land. We've chosen to do that through visualisation tools. Behind us is quite a significant hill country paddock, um, about 20 hectares, but there's some major challenges with it. So we kind of need to rethink what these paddocks look like and, and how we farm them. You know, using a tool like Hyper Farm, you can really test the water and see what it looks like um, before having that full commitment where, where you've got to go all in. I can think about my three-year-old son's future, make those decisions where we can strike a balance between looking after the land better, but also still operating a business where we look after our bottom line. It's got the potential to gently guide the way that farmers make decisions. I was really excited with Hyper Farm because I could see the massive potential that it had. With Hyper Farm, I'm able to see what difference that's gonna to make to the land that we're stewards of. So, um, yeah, that's what gets me excited about Hyper Farm. So essentially, we're using the visualisation, uh, visualise, we work with visualisation companies, um, animation research, and more recently, Next Space up in Auckland, to take a lot of that science that we do um, and to put that into forms where people can interact with it. And, and it's really the interaction which is the key here. So um, to facilitate the discussion rather than um, here's a solution, it's more to actually get people onto that bandwagon of how I would like my future um, to be envisaged and then achieved. So essentially, if we think about um, achieving a future um, um, uh, um, a vision, whatever that vision is, um, some of the main uh, things, science components of that question is, what could I grow? Is it grass? Is it apples? Is it um, asparagus? Um, uh, and, and what are the yields I'm likely to make from that? And then also, quite importantly, what are the financial um, prospects that I'm dealing with here? Uh, am I going to go broke in achieving that vision? Uh, is it going to land me better off than where I am now? Um, and also, how does that fit into a regulatory process? So uh, what are my pressures? What am I trying to achieve? And where would I, um, how would I most likely achieve that? And then ultimately, that then needs to turn from, from, from information into knowledge that people can interact with and, and react to um, uh, 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 while then executing their goal. The bit that Hyper Farm, the, the project that we work on and the, the, uh, the, the effort that we're currently working towards, looks at trying to bring in this information, um, I'll just see if this has got a pointer on it, yes, bring in this information uh, here to say, well, what are the opportunities, what are the um, prospects of that? And then we interact, uh, uh, we, you know, in this model, we then interact with, 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 with um, uh, you know, um, what the outcomes are uh, for, for the environmental um, uh, framework with, within which we work within. But essentially, um, once we work out what can grow, um, where are the opportunities, it then starts to lend itself towards saying, well, what, what is a region, what are we trying to achieve here, and, and, and what are the supporting infrastructure that is required? So essentially, we work on um, uh, uh, GIS layers, we, we do a lot of mapping, um, and once we can bring everything into a central framework here, it's very easy to say, well, if I'm gonna grow potatoes, which we um, have dealt with potato growers before, if I'm going to grow potatoes, where's the likely place that I should be growing potatoes and where would I put my um, processing plants? So then we can look at opportunities with people who want potatoes around the world um, and to say, all right, well, well where, where would that be positioned and how does that fit into a regional plan? Um, so there's our land use opportunities. And the moment we report back on some key metrics, greenhouse gas, water quality, finance, labour and carbon emissions, um, to achieve that goal. 
do you want to? Sure. Yes. So the way a uh, high perform works is it starts by the baseline and considering what is currently growing on the land. And it provides information about what are the estimated environmental, financial, uh, and some social outcomes from what is currently growing. And it is reporting this information on a one hectare grid, as you can see here, with a qualitative information. Is it very good or very bad? And it is positioning different parts of the land on this scale. So, um, so in, interesting as we've work, walked along this journey with um, our colleagues at the Rural um, Innovation Lab, uh, uh, amongst others, um, we've learned that you know some of the science approaches here that we can take. This is sediment loss at a one metre squared grid, are very clever, but extremely um, OTT for decision making um, uh, discussions, and, and and essentially these tools have got to be user-friendly as well as scientifically robust. So that's one of the reasons why we shifted down towards a one hectare grid. Um, uh, generally, the type of scale that's being used for decision-making around um, um, landscape uh, planning. Uh, this is an example from, from out uh, on the Banks Peninsula where um, we've modelled sediment loss across uh, this farm. The farmers looked at um, uh, where their issue of sediment loss is most prevalent uh, and to then say, okay, well, now I know where my pressures are, I can start thinking about alternatives at those locations. And in this instance, there was trees planted, so virtually trees planted in order to assess the drop in, in, in sediment loss. And, um, and, and within the, the, the model, one of the, the sort of in the sort of um, platform, one of the models that we're extremely pleased with is the ability to look at land use options. And, and this is the land use suitability model within uh, the tool, with green showing uh, where, in this instance, uh, hemp is most suitable for growing, um, um, marginal and not suitable, and the limitations of why that decision's been made. And the, the way that we've built this model is we've pulled off um, um, billions of, of data points, literally billions of data points of where hemp grows around the world. We've understood those environments through models um, and, and, and data approaches. We've understood those environments where that crop's grown currently. And then we've conveyed that across to New Zealand to understand where we have similar uh, types of climates here. Um, so that will tell you where hemp can biophysically grow. And just, uh, we put four videos in here and it absolutely killed our rural broadband last night. Um, and the kids again were extremely cross that um, the Netflix didn't work. So <laughs> I'm pushing play now, there we go. Right, so, so this is some of the work that we're doing with um, a big apple grower in, in, in New Zealand where that apple is, is, is currently grown in, in um, Spain, somewhere, somewhere, I think it's Spain, right? Uh, uh, they, have a, they have a license around the, that, that product, um, and they would like to know where they can grow that, um, that, that apple, which is a particular type of apple that requires a particular um, conditions. They would like to understand where they can grow that around New Zealand, and that's some of the work we've done using the, the land use suitability model. Um, to say, to say where, um, where that apple will grow. Um, on the other side of that uh, slide is some work we've done for New Zealand wine growers just in the last six months to say, okay, well, it's all very well telling us where, where apples, or, or in this case Sauvignon Blanc grows now, um, but that's not really our issue, is it? Our issue is in 2050, um, where will that grow? So where are the future opportunities here but also where is the Sauvignon Blanc growing region going to move to so we can start understanding some of the infrastructure that is required um, in association with that um, production. Uh, and, and, and so we've now taken with this a 2050 climate to look at the spread of Sauvignon Blanc down from its current region um, where it could potentially grow in the future. The financial opportunities, do you want to? 
I can do that if you want to. Uh, so high perform is providing an information about the financials of uh, different scenarios for the land. So what is my current uh, financial statue and what will be my statue with different land use option. And not only we are reporting a value on mature stage for each land use, we also provide an information about the temporal fl uh, change in cash flow. So um, the user can understand the different uh, stage for the transition from one uh, current state to a future state of different land uses. So, so essentially, um, with this, we, we're not, um, we're not uh, where, where it makes sense for us to, uh, to create models, that's what we do, that's uh, what, what we've done in the past. Where it makes sense for us to create those models, that's what we do. But um, the, the, essentially the framework that we're trying to describe here is one where it's, it's providing, the greatest value here is providing the plumbing and the interaction for existing tools, basically. So we don't want to necessarily be um, the finance gurus, uh, but we want to link with people who do do finance well um, in this instance, we believe that, that, that the extent of the detail here um, is, 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 is good for the purpose. And then through the tool, the, the user can break down into more detail, uh, right down into um, the, the price paid uh, um, for, the, for, the, for the meat that was um, um, uh, sold. Uh, as well as um, some of the complexities around bringing in different aged animals and the box of the cost of a box of apples or or whatever. So essentially, we've got a breakdown into detail um, approach within the tool. And um, and 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 within and as I mentioned before, within the tool, there's. Uh, there's uh, models that can understand, if I was to grow apricots here um, uh, and diversify paddock 52, because paddock 52 is, a, is a quite a low producing paddock, um, it's environmentally um, uh, challenging for me. Um, these types of maps are able to understand where on your farm you have the challenge, essentially. Uh, and then as a change is made to then understand the impacts of that. So here the users put in four different, uh, three different scenarios that they can compare against the base farm and changes can be made um, at, a, uh, at, at, a, at a quite a low um, uh, resolution. So you can put fences, say, where you wanted to or you could, um, you know, put trees where you wanted to. This is not... Um, or it could be, but it's not necessarily a discussion about how I have, a, have a, a landscape which I want to turn to forestry. It's not that. It's basically saying, I have some pressures on my land. Um, how can I limit the areas of, 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 um, of uh, um, mitigation, uh, the areas that are designated to mitigation, to where I've got that problem? And what are the prospects of doing that? Um, uh, so um, we have used visualisation for a couple of years now. Um, it's extremely powerful. Uh, we can take riparian strips. We can show people what they look like. Um, that people can create a emotional attachment to those um, to those visions, which is really important. I can see myself growing. Um, asparagus, or I can see that riparian strip working well on my land, um, and and to emotionally attached to that. But also, what we're doing with the visualization is our models won't be able to pick up all of the nuances within a farm. So the farmer, you guys have that in your head. Invariably, when you work through these types of situations you'll know that paddock there is boggy or that paddock there is where we had the winter um, grazing and, and, um, and it's, it's crap or it's, um, you know, this is where we've got a spring. So we can't pick that up with models, right? But invariably as you use the tool, you will understand and know these nuances that are then incorporated into the farm. So essentially we're 
in, um, 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 incorporating some of that tested knowledge which is in your head. Um, and, and, and we've more recently gone to virtual reality. That is my son. Um, he is, um, I suspect, probably playing Beat Saber, nothing, nothing um, too um, academic, actually. <laughs> I shouldn't say that. Um, but anyway, um, so we've found that um, virtual reality is a really powerful uh, tool, and Remy has got a particular project that we've just started on that. Yeah, I guess based on high perform, and I think we haven't mentioned that that much, but we worked a lot with user testing, so we had three different generations of high perform, which is a computer-based tool, and we tried different type of visualization, and it worked quite well, but um, we want to see how new technologies such as virtual reality could push the barrier a bit further and enable people to experience uh, immersive technology, we think could help them to um, find new designs and share their vision in a different ways that could potentially um, um, facilitate change. So this is a specific example with um, planting trees and designing a carbon neutral farm. We started that few months ago and we are working with Weira Runanga, it's a, an Idaho um, Runanga. And it's essentially um, a tool, uh, a virtual reality tool, so you play it with Google and as you are planting different type of trees from native to pine, uh, it is assessing what will be the estimated return in terms of profit and what will be the consequences for the farm emissions. And um, we're quite keen to take that down to maybe Queen Street to um, put those goggles on a few people to, to um, allow people to experience the, the, the challenge um, that is faced with making farms uh, um, carbon, carbon neutral. Uh, so, 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 um, so uh, one of the important things that, that we've realised through our journey is that um, yes, decisions are, are made by individuals, but probably more appropriately they're made by families, they're made by boards, um, they're made by groups, um, and the need to, um, for one person to have a vision and be able to effectively convey that vision to somebody else um, is quite a key part of this process. So it's, um, it's um, I have an idea, we should do this. Um, um, here's the sort of cost, here's the breakdown, and, and, and to then have the information at hand that can facilitate that discussion. Uh, again, Hyperfarm won't make that discussion. What it's trying to do is bring in all the bits of pieces so we're not um, um, you know, um, farming blind venison. Um, and bringing those into one place um, so that decision, or at least that discussion, can continue to flow. Um, and we can then, during that reporting process, compare farms. This is what it used to look like, this is what it will look like. Let's make the informed decision um, and all see the same vision. And the recommended land uses. So essentially, the first generation of Hyperfarm we developed was a try and see what happened. So essentially, people were required to test many different land uses before finding the right one to achieve the outcomes they wanted to achieve. Um, and we've learned from the engagement with the users that it wasn't enough. And so based on all the information that Hyperfarm is gathering around finance, around water quality, or around greenhouse gases emission, we now provide recommendations um, that are specific to the land and that are specific to the outcomes that the user wants to achieve. So we are providing a short list of land uses that we think could help to achieve specific things on a specific land. So what is my challenge <coughs> and what are the solutions? So essentially this is the same slide that I showed before, but you can see perhaps more, more clearly now the, 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 the conversation that is taking place, the key important parts of that conversation, and where we're hoping to um, add value within a community of, 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 of others in, in this space. Uh, and so very quickly, our journey, we started off doing very simple riparian strips. We've gone from single farm, and we're now um, able, well, we will in um, June. Yeah.
June. I was going to try and work out how many days. But um, June to go to all farms. So you can pick up any farm, you can load it up through through the LINS um, parcel layers and then um, the information within Hyperfarm will start being applied to that land mass. Um, we have a particular um, view that these types of um, tools are, um, are uh, um, sustainable where they, uh, where they essentially wash their own face. Um, and so in the future, we would hope that this type of platform is not just, um, uh, you know, we have some data, let's put it there, but actually what is the data required for the decision being made? And that's a process we're about to go through now, is to say where are the logical interoperabilities, as opposed to interoperability just to do it, where are the logical interoperabilities with other tools here? And we've got a um, particularly exciting um, uh, six months lined up where we're working with 15 iwi group around um, New Zealand, north and south, um, looking at some of the changes that they are, that they are making. And that's, um, that's essentially us. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you to Seth and Remy uh, for your introduction to Hyperfarm. Um, it was an insight into the future using design and modelling, uh, comparing scenarios and outcomes. And so the way I see it, you know, Hyperfarm could be another one of those potential tools in the toolbox of the future. So just a little gift here on behalf of um, Beef and Lamb for both of you. Thank you very much. We'll put our hands together for them, please. Well, yeah, thanks so